Us, good morning. How you doing? It's me, Analog Attack, back again. And today I'm chuffed to welcome from about two miles down the road, Mr. Ian Masters. How you doing, Ian? I'm fine, Mike. Morning. morning How you? you doing? Very good, thanks. All the better for seeing you. So today, <laughs> Japanese, <laughs> Japanese records, Japanese records. We're going to talk about. Yep. Records. It's a big umbrella. There's a lot of Japanese records. I think records. we can both get underneath it. I think so, yeah. And hopefully the, the wind won't take it away while we're using it. Nice metaphor. So, got to ask you, what was your first uh, exposure to Japanese music when you were a lad? Um, I reckon it was probably um, David Sylvian and okay. uh, Ryuchi Sakamoto okay. on Top of the Pops doing... Forbidden Colours. Oh, I remember that. In, yeah. Yeah. in 1980, would it have been? Okay, yeah. Like Sounds that. about right. Yeah. Yeah. I think you you can probably agree with me that in the um around that time there was very little Japanese music in in the uh on the radio in England and oh. in the charts. No. Almost almost nil. Maybe Yellow Magic Orchestra, perhaps? Not sure. I don't remember. I, I didn't even know that Ryuchi Sakamoto was a member of the Yellow Magic Orchestra. Me neither. Me neither. And I don't remember them ever being on, on top of the pops, but they may have been. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, it was a bit of a different route. As you know, I'm into sort of the punk and everything. So for me, it was um, reading fanzines like Maximum Rock and Roll and sort of learning about Japanese punk and hardcore yeah. early 80s. And that was it for me, really. I didn't sort of, you know, I only listened to Japanese punk and hardcore for like decades, you know. So you, you, you were getting all that stuff on import where you just I was, buy... and I actually had a little label. I was actually importing it and selling it mail order to. And John, right. Pe John Peel used to play a lot of the records that I sent him. He loved it. I mean, I'd send him a little stack of records and he'd, he'd often play them. He was really into it, so. Yeah, yeah well, he'd play anything, wouldn't he? He was, yeah. a, he was a omnivore. He was a big supporter of all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. That was great. So, yeah, I mean, I just went along with that for about 20 or 30 years and didn't really deviate from that too much until quite recently, really. So, yeah. So, I guess we, you've got a stack of records, right? I've got quite a big stack of records, which has been growing larger and increasing <laughs> until about five minutes before we started talking. <laughs> <laughs> as I, as I, oh, what about that one? Oh, oh yeah. and I grabbed it right. and stuck a date on it because I think what uh, what we talked about mm. was that uh, I th I thought it'd be a nice idea to do things chronologically. Yes, yeah. Because then we get to talk about the genres right. and uh, I like I like to think I like to to um, think about what records were coming out in England when certain records were coming okay. out in Japan. Right. It, to me, that's, it's pretty interesting. Yeah. I often find that even at times when English music was pretty boring, there would have been a lot, a lot going on elsewhere. And that's, uh, that's obvious, really. Exactly. But until yeah. we had the internet, we, we didn't have access to a lot of that information and a lot of that music. Absolutely. Absolutely. That was for me where I was lucky sort of being into the punk there was a lot of fanzines and stuff where you could find out about this kind of stuff you know yeah you had to dig a little bit deep but it was definitely out there but uh yeah so ian what are you going to show first yeah right okay yeah i'm going to show the smallest record smallest. in my collection okay oh what have we got a, there? this is a five inch record five inch wow and it's on the victor label mm. and these five inch records were called nippers nippers <laughs> they marketed them as nippers which is obviously the name of the uh mm. the dog as well um the music is it's it's two different artists one on each side right uh the, the a side is is quite dull uh, a very nasally male singer okay uh, singing, uh his name's minoru obata Okay. And his song is Dance Party in the Rain. But the, uh, the B-side is 
or rather more jaunty, a kind of mm. New Orleans jazz type song. Uh, two songs on the B side. Okay. Uh, shoe, shoe polish shop underneath the rain tra train tracks, mm. and I don't need poison. So I, I would love to be able to play uh, a snippet from these, but um, yeah, we might get the record. Yeah, we the might YouTube get clip off. will arrive and, and take Ian, us away. What, what, what year did that come out? Do you know? Okay, fifty-seven. Nineteen fifty-seven. Wow. So as with as with a lot of the records that I used to buy and still occasionally do get to buy, um, this came from a, fl a flea market, right? And it was right at the back of a box of LPs, almost invisible, being a, such a, a tiny little thing. Right. And it just looks so beautiful. Uh, you know, it, it had to be bought to find out what was on it. Can you play it? Yeah, yeah, it's a, four, it's a 45. Okay, but the five inch format's no problem, you can play it. Yeah, my, I don't, my, my uh, turntable doesn't have an auto okay. right. thing on it, to right, right. which uh, it just carries on playing. Cool. Um, what was it? Yeah. Okay, I was going to say something else, but I can't remember what it was, so I'll say it later. And I do remember. Okay, 57. So that's 57. I, I thought I was going to find stuff before that, but... Um, that's pretty old. I have quite a lot of 78s that have been bequeathed to me, and most of them are really, really depressing. The music, the, you know, the, the, sound, the voice... Obviously, the style of singing in the in the old days mm. before seventy uh, eights disappeared was much more somber right. and not not joyful, not not really enjoyable in any way. I, I don't know if you've heard that kind of stuff. I do. I do find it a bit depressing, even if I can't always understand the lyrics. I just find the atmosphere of that stuff very dark and mournful and depressing. If you go to you know to Nishinari and you know the old karaoke places and the old yeah. men and ladies are sort of singing those songs. It's very sad atmosphere to a lot of that stuff. I wonder why that style was so prevalent. I can't mm -hmm. really imagine. Yeah, interesting. Okay, can I? I'm going to just yeah nip Jump in, in here. So I was talking about I was sort of just only listening to punk and hardcore, but out of the blue, Jello Biafra from the Dead Kennedys sent me a tape, and it was a tape of this band. Papaya Paranoia, it's an all girl well, band, five piece. It's on a major label. This is their second LP. It's from 1986, and yeah, it's kind of new wave. It's kind of like if the B52s were kind of a prog band, but it's a great record. This is sort of my first sort of non-punk uh, Japanese record. That I ever got into. Uh, was that bought after you moved to Japan? This was because you couldn't find the record in England, so I just had the tape for years. Yeah. And then one day I was in a record store in Nippon Bash, I think, and it's oh, that's that's that record that I've had on tape for sort of 15, 20 years. Of course, I snapped it up right away. Yeah. Interesting record. I can't think of a band that sounds anything like this band, but they're a pretty popular sort of major label band. Yeah. And it still sounds good today, does it? I, I, I Without, love it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it is kind yeah. of, it's very 80s sounding. It's very upbeat, poppy, a little bit of sort of B-52s in there a bit, but uh, good record. Yeah, it's a nice little poster inside as well. I'll quickly show this. Often, you know, poster. a lot of old records, uh, um, you know, you, you still like them, but it's hard to know how much is not you know the the nostalgia nostalgia part. yeah 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 because you know probably if you if you didn't have a lot of Japanese records and you heard something like that it's you know there's so many memories and right. other information yeah. bound up in that yeah I played it last night just to make sure and I, I still enjoyed it so definitely okay and what you got next in your palm mate right okay so we talked about mm. our first exposure to Japanese music yeah. and probably that was for both of us before we lived here yes absolutely. and then I moved here in 2000 okay. and I started going to flea markets and it seemed I felt like I knew nothing about Japanese music at all and 
being a person who writes music sometimes, I, I felt like if I, if I didn't explore as much Japanese, Japanese music as possible, it would be such a, such a waste. Right. Yeah. And I'm sure we've both bought tons of music that has turned out to be not our cup of tea at all. Yeah, absolutely. But in, you know, in about 20 years, you're, you're going to, you know, you're going to find some diamonds in the shit. Yes. You know, I, I'm glad we kind of grew up in that area where you had to dig and search and it wasn't all at your fingertips and you could just download the entire history of, you know, Okinawan music in 20 minutes from the internet. I, I'm so sort of happy that... Because it's, it's not much of an experience, is no, it? No. You know, the colourful characters that you meet at flea markets and no. the, you know, the, the, the slightly dodgy areas that you, the, you end up navigating to, to, you know, to get to that mecca of, of uh, stinky... Uh, uh, cabby, moldy, <laughs> moldy, moldy. <laughs> you know the Japanese forgot the English. There you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, what, what? What okay, so here's. Oh. Right. Oh, what we got here? This That's is another Victor, um, Victor label. A Koto, a Koto record by a master Koto player called I think it's called Michio Mi Mi Minagi. Okay. Uh, Michio Miyagi. Oh. And uh, he was. Yeah, it's on the, it's on the, his, his master's voice, Vic, Victor, Victor. Yeah, yeah. He he is probably one of one of the top Koto players from what I remember looking up ages ago. Wow, absolutely, absolutely beautiful. You know, it it's um not the kind of thing that you want to listen to all the time, mm. but when you just need a bit of uh, total relaxation, right. absolutely superb. He looks great, I have to say. I've got to point that out, that he looks fantastic. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's, uh, he looks like he's happy in his job, which is always a, <laughs> a good sign. Okay, and I'm going to let you continue. Pull out a few more and then right. I'll, I'll jump in whenever. All right, so that was, that was also 1957. 1957, wow. Obviously, all that traditional Japanese music was going on all the time, but the influence of American music was being felt, I guess, all, right. you know, since, since the war, after the war. And it's pretty obvious that at some point there was a huge Latin music boom in Japan. Yeah. And some of those bands were just playing straight Latin, mm. but other, uh, other musicians were combining old Japanese music, old minyo, with yeah. Latin rhythms. And this is one of my favorite ones of, of that category. Wow. This is uh, Jiemi Eri, and she's, sorry about the uh, reflection. No, no problem. She, pardon? No problem, yeah. Yeah, uh, she's being backed on this by Tadaki Misago and the Tokyo mm. Cuban Boys. Ah. The Tokyo Cuban Boys had a very, very long career, probably I've still got, going now. I've got a couple of their records, actually, yeah. 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 The nice thing about this is that um, Chiamieri's voice is really, really pure, absolutely mm. beautiful, and... The, the combination of the, the, the Mino style of singing mm. and the Latin rhythms is really, really nice. Wow. I've, you can pick, I mean, it's, it's getting harder to find this now, cheap, but um, I always buy it and, and give it to friends because uh, right. it's just something a little bit unusual and is, uh, I think they should hear it. Is that from the 60s, Ian? 60s? This is from 58. 58? Wow, still a bit, okay, wow. So the 50s was the uh, Latin music boom. Yeah, pretty, pretty much, I think. Yeah, right, wow. Um, probably mid 50s to uh, early 60s. Okay, interesting. Very nice. Next That's a very... One. I don't really have... A... Next one is a uh, 78. Wow. Um, 
this kind of this this is um nana iro kamen a superhero called nana iro kamen which means a seven colored mask okay so this is the theme tune from the tv series which right. was apparently japan's first superhero tv tv series uh the, the singing style is is that kind of somber fairly uh unexciting style that we were talking about a little bit earlier so um i i listened to it once with my uh, special 78 needle and thereafter not at all but i, <laughs> I just i mean the design is so beautiful it is yeah 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 it's a it's a king record our king uh, king records amazing all their records sound really amazing yeah this this one probably doesn't sound so good it's oh. it, it looks like it's uh serves mm. as a dinner plate for quite a few years <laughs> but um anyway i just wanted nice. to flash that one cool cool are we getting into the 60s yet or are we still in the 50s we're we're, we're, we're up to 1959 and moving okay. very, very slowly. <laughs> okay. I think you probably know these, these sisters. Oh, no, I don't. Do I? Um, identical twins. Yeah. Um, I think they may have been initially uh, actresses. They appear okay. in Mothra. The, okay. the Mothra film, yeah, yeah. and they sing a they sing a, the Mothra theme in uh, some made up language. Made up language, wow! It's not Japanese, wow. and it's certain, it certainly ain't English. <laughs> and uh, this is one of the one of their first records. And this is this is also, I mean, the the A side is a uh, is more or less a pop tune, uh, right. maybe. Kaiokyoku, which is you know the the Japanese pop song right. kind of format of that, yeah. of that era, but for me the the B side, uh, which is called uh, Yoneyama Sankara, which means Ooh. from Mister from Mister Yoneyama. Yeah, that is um, that also has that Latin beat okay. and oh. some very very unusual chord changes. Uh, the very first time I heard that. I, maybe on a mixtape somewhere, I thought I've, I've got to track that down. And you did? Um, flea market, did. Flea market find or record shop? Flea market again. Flea market. Yeah. 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 The good old flea markets, of which there are none at the moment. <laughs> true, true. All right, let's. let's what do you got next? I'm excited. It's, uh... We're into the 60s. Yes, the year of our birth. Into the... We've made it. We've made it into the 60s. Okay. This is uh, yet another flea market find. Um, oh. 10 inch. I like the look of that. The, wow. um, I have to say the, the, the jacket is more impressive uh, than the music is accessible. Uh, okay. It's uh, music for no theatre. All right. Uh, I think a variety of people. Lots of flutes. Um, Lots of uh, other traditional Japanese instruments, right. you know, I guess used to accompany the n no performances. Right. Uh, yeah, that's all I have to say on that. Cool. Good looking record. Yeah. And when you, when you find records of that age in such good condition, yeah. it's, um, it's a bit of a no brainer, isn't it? Yeah. So, that's one I would definitely uh, buy just based on how it looks. Absolutely. Just yeah, looking, yeah. I, I suspected that the the, the content might be, might not be really that exciting, but um, uh, if you left it there, you'd never you'd never know. Right. I'd rather that buy makes... it and find out that it's not good than than leave it there and be kicking myself. Absolutely. I used to go to um, a recycle centre mm. in Mino. Okay. So pe people would just people would take stuff that they no longer needed and just leave them there. Really. And you could go there on a Saturday morning and you could basically within, you know, within reason, you could take stuff. Wow. And, I think you I've know, heard and, about that. Yeah. I never went for it. So, yeah. Wow. And, um, so I used to go there with a, with a friend from, from the neighborhood and, and just, you know, grab all the interesting records I could find. So I've got loads of these kind of, oh. this is probably from 1960. 
kabuki. Loads of this kind of traditional music. Oh, right. A lot of them are what they call nagauta. Okay. So um, stories sung in in not not really what you could call melody, but um, almost like intoned or um, the you know the, the music is is just carrying the story along. Right. So you get a, like a, a a 15 minute story on one side and a 15 minute story on the other side. Right. And it, in, unless you're I guess unless you're interested in that all those old stories, all those old uh, folk tales, then uh, you need to do a bit more reading before you listen to the records. <laughs> okay. One more, one more Latin music okay. record from uh, 61. Uh, T. T. Arima's Japanese Melody by uh, Toru Arima and his Noche Cubana. Oh, look at him. So this, is, this is a, a very nice um, big band style, um, pretty up tempo. Mm. The songs on it are, yeah, I don't think they're not traditional songs done okay. in a, a Latin style like the uh, Chiemieri uh, record, but um, right. this was probably one of the first Latin records I found. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a real, it's a cheery listen. <laughs> cool. Uh, and good for good for drunken home parties. I'll drink to that. That's Dan dancing around the uh, early dancing around the counter, throwing beer everywhere. Early sixties. I think that one was si 60, 61. Okay. Beautiful. Should I carry on? Go ahead, my man. Yeah. Right. Another record from sixty one, and. As with a lot of cultures, uh, record companies knew that they would sell more records by putting scantily clad ladies on record <laughs> sleeves. So um, this is one of those. Oh, Pink Mood Show. Pink Mood Show. <laughs> and this is, this is um, fairly standard uh, light Latin jazz uh, Fodder. Uh, there was a, there was another one similar to this that is some, is, is uh, somewhere <laughs> in my collection. That was uh, that was the record falling on the ground. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> and now it's, a, it, now it's a double album. Double album. <laughs> Two five-inch singles. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, there's there's, a, there's another record which I wanted to find which I couldn't, which is a bit better than this one. But um, these these are always quite fun. Uh, the content is, uh, you know, just old, old, mm. uh, early sixties jazz, right. very, you know, easy on the ear. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you've never been tempted by those kind of, uh, exploitative covers. Oh, I, I've been, I've definitely been tempted. <laughs> If you, if, you, yeah. if you go to record shops in Nipponbashi, that those kind of records are up on the wall for three thousand yen, thousand yeah. yen, yeah. which yeah. is thirty, forty dollars, isn't it? Yes, and yeah. it, that that would definitely be a complete waste of money. It would, uh, but but from a flea market flea for three hundred yen, yeah. it's uh, again, it's just what's what's going to be on it, right? Okay, so we talked about the Latin, the Latin uh, minio fusion boom, yeah. I think probably the next the next one to come along was uh, the Eleki the Eleki boom, right? Which was probably in part caused by the Ventures making their first trips to Japan. Yeah, I, think I so. imagine. Yes, absolutely. And that spawned a multitude of probably hundreds of of copycat guitar bands, didn't it? Right. Um, one of the, one, I guess, probably one of the most famous in Japan was uh, Takeshi Tarauchi and Blue Jeans. Okay, yeah. And his his various other incarnations. 
Oh, I've, I've definitely seen that record, yeah. So this is 1966, a combination of minyo, so old, old Japanese folk songs played in an eleki style. Cool. I think I've got a record of him with Teru Masahino. Okay. Playing, like rock and roll style, you know, eleki. Yeah. With, with uh, Teru Masa doing, doing the trumpet on it. Yeah, yeah. How's that? How's that one? It's okay. Yeah. Not one of my favorite Teru Masahino records, but it's definitely interesting. Uh, as, with, uh, as with a lot of musicians, they did their, a lot of their, well, some of them anyway, they did their best work early on. And yeah. especially with, th with this guy, um, uh, Takeshi Tarauchi, he, his, I think his, he didn't really change his style much right. over the years, over decades, but the, the ideas gradually dried up. The, the way that the, the songs were recorded sounded more and more modern, mm. cleaner, not, not nearly as interesting. Right, yeah. So this yeah. is, you know, this is, I mean, it's still, it's still very, very well recorded. This is another King record. So they obviously yeah. had, they had the top, you know, the, the best gear in their studios uh, of probably any of the, the big studios. Right. And it, it, it kind of, I've, I've often found that um, Japanese, beat records from the 60s lack lack an edge which they're is bit, present they're a bit polite yeah absolutely and that's that, that's a problem that i have with a lot of the group sounds uh, yeah. records group sounds being uh, probably the the, the a, a variation of the eleki thing so there are some quite wild bands though right like the spiders and the golden cups and those kind of bands they were quite wild yeah um the first Golden Cups LP is, is pretty good, especially an amazing version of Hey Joe. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You must know that. Yeah, yeah, that yeah, is yeah. probably the best version of Hey Joe ever, cool. including Hendrix's. Yeah, I, um, I just feel like maybe they kind of wanted to kind of, like, you know, let their hair down a bit more, but probably the record company was trying to, you know, let's go this push way. Push them towards, uh, you know, if you, go, if you go crazy, then you're not going to get the housewives buying your... Right. Or single. Yeah, it's kind but of that, very polite. Their version of Hey Joe ought to have been released as a as a as a single, even right. if it, I think it's six or seven minutes long. Yeah. Uh, if if that had been released as a single, I'm sure it would have been amazingly popular. But yeah, I think so. Probably again, the the record execs got in the way and prevented that from happening. I think so. Yeah, it's too wild. Yeah. Okay, and on the same the same subject, the same band. Mm. Uh, I'll show this one because this is one that this is one that might be oh. a little bit easier to come by. This is the same uh, Takashi Terauchi uh, and the Bunnies doing mm. "Let's Go Classics." So it's classical music played by an Eleki band. Wow, that's like you must, you must have seen this. I in, might have done, but that's like time. preceding like what's his name, Rock Me Amadeus, by about three decades. I don't know what Rock Me Amadeus is. Oh, it's that oh, Austrian guy, uh, Falco, did that song Rock okay. Me Amadeus. He's dressed up like that from the 80s. Yeah. yeah. It's surprisingly good. Um, it, it, you know, the joke wears a little bit thin over the course of an LP, but... Um, okay. Right. Yeah. If you come to... If, you, if, if Japan ever lets people in again to go on holiday, then... Um, <laughs> You should look for that record. Yeah. Okay. Let's change tack. Okay. Where are we going now? 1967. Oh, the year of my birth. There you go. A young woman called Jun Mayuzumi oh. was signed to Capitol Records and started making extremely popular pop songs, Kayo okay. Kyoku. Uh, very funky. Uh, excellent backing band. Her 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 song called Black Room is uh, probably the most well known uh, Jun Mayuzumi song in the West yeah. because it appears on compilations. And yeah. that's the that's actually the B side of one of the, one of the following singles to 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 uh, after this. This was yeah. 
67. She's got an absolute belter of a voice. Oh. Um, super clear. Um, a, you know, quite funky, very, very upbeat pop songs. Nice. Um, until, I think, un until mid 70s when she started going a, a bit Enka and then okay. went full, full Enka. Uh, most of her most of her singles are, are definitely worth picking up and listening to. Cool. Jun Mayasuke. So that one was uh, Kiri no ka Kanata ni, mm. which is uh, something about the fog, isn't it? Something about. Mm. Uh, I thought I'd have it in my notes. Beyond the fog. Beyond the fog. Good title. Oh, and it's got it's got an, a, a really I, f I forgot it's got a really really weird steel guitar intro which is I mean somebody needs to nick that it's uh, <laughs> it's perfect for perfect for sampling. Wow, nice. Not that I'd encourage any illegal activity. <laughs> and in a slightly similar vein, okay. from the same year, nineteen sixty-seven, uh, we couldn't talk about Japanese music without talking about Hibari Misora. Of course. Wow. So this woman uh, is probably the best known female singer in Japan, would you say? I'm going to hold my hands in the air and say that I've never heard of her. Okay. So let's educate. She's, she's, she's very, very much loved by uh, people especially in their probably 60s and 70s and 80s okay and, and, and above uh she started when she was a kid had a um a career of 41 years singing mm. first release 58 last release 1989 okay this a lot of her stuff is anchor all right and i know that because i, I bought quite a lot after I bought this, and this is not Enka. This is mm. uh, this is like um, Kaio Kyoku or group sounds. Okay. Uh, that that you know, it's, it's a much more upbeat pop song. Totally, okay. totally out of her um, her normal Enka style. Right. This is. Um, the, the best record I've ever heard by her. Okay. But she's, you know, she, she had an amazing voice. She, you know, she, she, and she sang from when she was a kid. Right. Um, you know, I think if you, uh, if you watch the programs at New Year about um, old Japanese music, she'll make an appearance okay. in one place or another. So this is um, Makana Tayo, uh, Bright Red Sun, something mm. like that. Yeah. 67 and this sold apparently this sold 1.4 million copies wow so this is this is also not not hard to find right Abs an absolute belter yeah i wish we could play some samples but people can we're going to put some links aren't we in the description so people can have a listen yeah, yeah. and clips of these are all over youtube okay and, nice and sometimes on discogs as well okay I must, I must refresh my mouth. <laughs> mm. All right, where are we going next? Okay, next is from 1968, the Ooh. second album by a group sounds band called The Tigers. Ah, now we're talking. I have that record. Human, human Renaissance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you think of it? It's okay, it's a little bit, as I said, it's a little bit polite. A little bit sugary. Yeah, but... I don't know. It's a decent record. I, so, I love the cover, the artwork, and everything. The, the, isn't the the main guy sort of famous? Isn't he? Isn't is that the bloke? I forget his name. He's sort I of. I think Julie is the main guy, and he he had a long TV career. Yeah, yeah, that guy. Um, the drummer was called um, P. <laughs> so you can imagine what his nickname was. <laughs> Probably um, P. <laughs> Um, so I think 
I, I'm not sure, but I always thought that um, I always thought that the Tigers must have been Polydor's attempt at having a Beatles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. The first album, uh, "The World Is Waiting for Us," is very much in a, a kind of Beatles, slightly concept albumy. Uh, very, very simple pop songs. Yeah. And, you know, that's kind of interesting for a couple of listens. But for some reason on, on this album, there's a lot more weird stuff going on. Right. A lot of reverbed vocals. Okay. Uh, good, good songs, but, but much more, you know, the, the, the ambition between the, the first LP and this one is uh, palpable. Right. Um, they're going more psychedelic and for that I mean this this is another LP that you find in bargain bins all the uh, time yeah yeah, yeah but yeah. don't let that um if you if you come across it don't let that uh dissuade you from, from right. picking up a cheap copy well I think they I think pressed think a lot I mean it's Polydor yeah. major label they probably pressed thousands and thousands that's why it's yeah know, yeah like, yeah I'm sure they did I'm sure they did yeah um yeah, I mean they they had they had a lot of good pop singles, uh, but then then again, I think after a while the the quality started to deteriorate. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Are we in the right. we're in the seventies yet? No, we're, <laughs> we're <in> the... <laughs> last um last one of the last one of the sixties. All right, another another female singer, uh, Akiko Wada. Oh. Big name. So Akiko Wada is known in Japan probably mostly for her TV, her TV shows. Yeah. Um, she's also known as a, a bit of a bully, apparently, in the in the showbiz world. She's uh, quite a character, isn't she? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of stories. Um, I'm sure I heard stories of. Uh, my wife's friends being too scared to go to number on a Saturday afternoon in, ca in case they bumped into her. Well. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know why, I don't know why um, Akiko Wada would be interested in, you know, no. just ordinary lads walking around, but no. apparently her, her reputation was so fierce in, in the early days that uh, people were generally nervous about meeting her in the street. Wouldn't go to number. <laughs> In case they bumped Just into in case she, in case she was there. Um, so she, she, Akiko Wada also had, went through a, a lot of different styles in her career, but apparently mm. she was an absolutely huge Ray Charles fan. Okay. Mm. And um, around this time, this is, this is my, fa my favorite record by her. This is um, Doshaburi no Ame no Nakade, which means oh. Uh, out in the out in the pouring rain, and this is a, 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 a an excellent uh, soul song with horns. Oh, okay. Uh, a wicked a wicked type band, uh, up tempo. She's she's got. I mean, she's. I'm sure you can you can vouch for this. She has an absolute belter of a voice. Well, I was going to say sort of Scylla Black, the Japanese Scylla Black. Is, that's not really fair. Lulu, I don't know. Big voice. Yeah, I mean, a fog horn of a voice. Yeah, 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 yeah. Here we go, here we go. <laughs> it's all happening. <laughs> we, uh, the beer's arrived. <laughs> there we go. There you go. Akiko Wada's come round for a beer. <laughs> bloody, I bloody hope not. I'm, 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 I'm already <laughs> she quivering. You, she heard you talking about her. Yeah. Um, what else was I going to say about this? Uh, oh, she... Um, hmm. On her 58th, she, she was obviously a, a huge soul fan. Right. On her 58th birthday, she did a gig at the Apollo in Harlem. Apparently the first solo Japanese artist oh. to, to do that. Didn't and um, yeah. so I thought that was, you know, she, she, it was obviously a high point of her career. She, yeah, she really wanted to be there and feel like she was part of that. That's a, that's a very big achievement, isn't it? Well, I, I guess somebody of her, her stature can probably afford to drop a bit of money hiring out a theatre for a night. But um, true, true. 
Yeah. It looked like I've, the clips I've seen of it looked like uh, everyone was enjoying it. Nice. Wow. Uh, uh, yeah. Kudos to her for uh, carrying out, you know, to carrying out her dream of, of doing yeah, that. Absolutely. It's the end of the sixties. Is it? Do we do we stop for a sandwich? A sandwich and a pipe. <laughs> Actually, we're, we're on like 43 minutes now. Let's see how, how long we can keep going. Okay. Yeah. Let's get, let's get into the 70s. I've got a record. I've got some records from the 70s too. So, yeah. Okay. And I yeah. expect you will probably have a record by this woman, Maki Asakawa. Oh, you betcha. Which one have um, you got? The one I've got here I've got is... Single. Oh, is nice. I've never seen that. That's very cool. Yeah. It's... Uh, Minato no Higanbana. So okay. there's something about port, isn't it? But the, the track I like is is the B side, which is Akai Hashi, Red Bridge. So okay. I think these are both these are both tracks of her first LP, which, which is is here. The one that Mike's holding. That's that is superb. I mean I uh, so I'm getting excited now. I, I I'm gonna struggle with what I wanna say because she's so good that I just my words cannot do her justice. Just one of a kind, one of a kind voice, one of a kind. Yeah. Like, just the whole, the whole vibe. If I use that word, but I mean, she was a lot, a lot. soul. I'm a jazz blues singer, but it was just such a another level of uh, and a lot of cover versions. But you know, she made the songs her own. And I mean, we yeah, could do a whole, we could do a whole, we could do a whole episode about her. I've got pretty much all of her records. So absolutely amazing. My favorite favorite Japanese singer of all time you um, hear you hear her yeah uh, yeah her voice is absolutely superb you hear, oh. you hear her voice and there's no mistaking who it is, is oh there? I mean it, honestly I still get I'm just talking about it I'm getting the sort of goosebumps that the first song on this record there's the train the train yeah. station that sounds amazing like it's like it, I don't know how they got that sound it, but it, it transports like, you into the album doesn't it yeah it feels like the train is like coming up you know right at you and it's uh yeah just I'm going to go back to the thing. I don't know if I mentioned it, but like not being able to understand the lyrics, but still, still being able to kind of feel, uh, feel the emotion of a song without understanding the lyrics. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. You don't, people, you don't, you really don't need to with her. No. But what I wanted to say to people is don't be put off if you can't, you know, it's not in your native, you know, language. It doesn't matter. Like, it's like and the, 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 the song I was um, recommending, right. the red, the red bridge, is is a case in point um it's a song about some uh let's see where's it going uh i've forgotten something it's, it's, it's a a song about people who cross a bridge right. across a uh a mysterious river and and the people who cross that bridge never come back right yeah so it's kind of, it's probably a it's probably some kind of um folk tale uh but her voice on it is so mournful. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's the the backing is so strong. I I defy anybody not to be moved by that song. Oh, I mean, and yeah. That that LP is just full of absolute classics. Yeah, I like to imagine I just sort of sat in the back of like a little dusty sort of old jazz club, you know, with a cigarette, you know, sat in the dark corner. I, I think she lived quite. A, an interesting life, I, I think. Um, yeah. Didn't she start off singing at um, Air Force bases yeah, and stuff that's like right. that? That's right. Just yeah, just covers, you know, stat blues and jazz standards, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. But she's from Nagoya, though, um, right? I think. Oh, is she? Yeah. yeah. Um, who, what that label is she on? Express. Express doesn't have Express. The Express label doesn't have a huge reputation for good music, does it? But they no they. Gold. They struck gold with her. Yeah, this is yeah on Express. So yeah, yeah. But uh, she kind last, of so oh, Damon Damon from Blur. He has that label, Honest John's. He did like a two a double LP compilation of yeah. songs, and after that came out, people started, you know, buying these records. The originals, not the yeah. you know, and the prices sort of shot up. Kind of like the Julian Cope book effect, where people suddenly found out about all these records and yeah, it's kind of shot through the roof. But uh, you can still find these records, but you know, 
couple of thousand, three thousand yen, if you like. Yeah, that, that, and that, that they're still, as you say, this Japanese people are Japanese buyers are still uh, scooping them up. Yeah, I mean, if, if I see them, I buy them. Absolutely, yeah, amazing. And can I I'll just? Yeah. As I, as we're here, so her Maki's first album was called like. Uh, Maki Asakawa's world, like Maki Asakawa no Sekai, and Mikami Tang. Yeah. You know, I'm a big fan. This is his. Yeah. This is a, a third or fourth album. Amazing cover. Amazing. Amazing. I think it's sort of famous. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, you know, he's a sort of folk blues singer, but you can probably tell by looking at the the cover that he wasn't really a very conventional kind of a fellow. Very rebellious. What, what year is that? That's uh, 1971. It's live, live record. And it says some of it was recorded at the Budokan, but I'm not sure I believe it. Yeah. So yeah. Mikami Khan. Mikami Khan. And he is Liz Fraser from the Cocteau Twins' favorite singer. Yeah. So, yeah, there you go. And she said that when Amaz she Amazing him, jacket. Yeah, it's amazing. She said that when she saw him play, as I was going back to, you know, I was saying we did, you know, you don't have to understand like the lyrics. She didn't understand a word he was saying, but she was sort of, sort of deeply moved by Entranced. his voice, by his voice. Yeah. And he's he's still playing gigs, isn't he? You you I you've do promoted... book him like once a year. He plays in this tiny little venue in uh, Osaka. He's a, he's a good bloke, good bloke. Yeah, still going strong. He puts out records on this really tiny little punk label from Kochi. Who I, I know the guy is called Dando Records, and he puts out CDs on that label, so it's kind of interesting. No, he, but does he no longer put out LPs, vinyl? No, he's not done any vinyl for a while, but he's put out a lot of like double CDs and DVDs and stuff. So Mikami Khan, he's, he's kind of a legend. He's a bit of an acquired taste, I think. Oh, he definitely, and he—it's all storytelling, and it's when you see him live, it's all improvised. You just sort of don't know where he's going to go. He'll take a three-minute song and make it into a forty-minute song and so yeah it's an acquired yeah. taste but uh yeah but that's nice it's, it's always nice when uh when when artists don't just play the songs in exactly the same oh, format absolutely. as you hear them on the record yeah yeah i mean he's he's made understand. my you know he's made the pairs on the back of my neck stand up a few times seeing him but uh yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, well you, you can't ask for more than that can you no i mean that's that's that 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 sensation is basically my yardstick for keeping a record or getting rid of it. Okay. If, it, if the record, if a record doesn't do that doesn't for do me it. anymore, right? Then it's it's probably not much use to me anymore. Right. Okay, Ian. Let's move on. What's next in your pile? We're in the seventies, right? Okay, it's time to hit the jazz vein. Cool. Briefly. Cool. Okay. With Terry Masahino. The man. Oh, that and the could be my favorite of his. Hynology. Yeah. So this is his, his, uh, is it the quintet or the, I think it's the quintet. Yeah. It's amazing cover with the reflection in the sunglasses there. So I am. Um, when I used to go to my local regular flea market, I right. would uh, meet meet a guy who was very, very knowledgeable knowledgeable about Japanese music. Mm. Uh, more a, more a, a, a buyer than a than a music uh, lover. Right. Although I think he's a music lover too, but he's he's just an encyclopedia of of information. And at the, at the time I bought this, I'd never heard of, of uh, Taro Masahino. Mm. And uh, that, that, that guy uh, recommended this LP. Right. And I think probably w w I was able to find a copy that very day. Wow. Uh, in, in the flea market for 300 yen or something like really? that. Really? And that's a very this, good find. It, mm. Well, you know, if you, go, if you go to flea markets every, every week for five or 10 years, you, you, right. you know, it's, I think the balance of probabilities is that you're going to get lucky yeah. occasionally. Right. Mm -hmm. But um, this is very, very good. Yeah. Um, he was obviously uh, a fan of Miles, Miles Davis. Davis. Yeah, yeah. I think the first track on, on this album is called uh, Like Miles. Mm. 
and yeah, yeah. looking at the the chronology of the of the two of the two people of of Miles and uh, Terry Massa, the the album that Miles had just made was Miles in the Sky, 1968, okay. and then All right. and then this came out fairly soon after that. There's right. a fair amount of you can you can hear he he's, he's a Miles Davis lover, yeah. but yeah, you know he's great. Yeah, he's good. Dropped off in the late 70s, early 80s, but anything up to that is great. I think yeah, where, where he goes, um, where he goes, jazz fusion. That's that's yeah. a dangerous territory. It is dangerous. And yeah, we don't want to be very very more, careful. More anything dangerous than as he's after about 75. Mm. Yeah, I think so. Pyramid. Right, so, uh, mm. One more thing about have you have okay. you got any more to say about um, Terra Masahino? No, just I was going to just touch on the jazz a little bit, but go ahead if you have something. I, okay, just the last a couple of mm. last comments about mm. uh, about um, Terra Masahino. I've seen him play three times right. in the last five or so years, Takatsuki and jazz festival. he does amazing gigs. Uh, um, oh. all, all, each time at Takatsuki Jazz. Okay. His his gigs are just uh, he he knows how he knows how to get people moving. Right. Um, every, every time a little bit different, but absolutely superb performances. Right. He's got he's got you know as you can imagine he's having been going for so long he's got um he's got a lot of fans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you may you may be able to confirm this. Was he the first? Japanese jazz musician signed to Blue Note. Have you ever heard that? I've not heard that, and I don't have any records by him on Blue Note, so I'll have to. Maybe, have maybe that's a bit of a folklore thing. Okay. Okay, so yeah, I mean Japanese jazz. I mean that's a whole. I mean you could do twenty episodes on Japanese jazz from free jazz to you know, right. Um, so. For anyone who sort of wants to dip their toes into the world of Japanese jazz, I would absolutely. Oh yeah, yeah, that's absolutely superb. I mean, so well done. It's a British label called Jazzman Records. This is they do a spiritual jazz series. There's a whole bunch. This is the Japanese one. Um, yeah, Mitsuaki Kano, Tadao Hayashi, a whole bunch of people. But it's so well done. So there's I, a there's I a think... second volume of the of the Japanese one, isn't there? Yeah, there's two with a blue. Yeah. There you go. It's the red. It's like the Beatles, the red one and the blue one. So yeah, yeah, both they're, great. They're both excellent, aren't they? I think they're both still in print. So you know, if you want to check out some Japanese jazz, this is a really good way to dip your toe in. I think. Yeah, yeah Jackman Records of it from England. And there's another one too, uh, Ian. I don't know if you know this one. Also out of England, but uh, sorry, BBE Records did this triple, triple LP. Yeah. Is a good yeah, I, I bought that, and it for some reason it it didn't uh, it didn't excite me as much as the Jazzman ones. It has a different sort of feel to it, doesn't it? Um, and the song selection. A, There's some a, good a, stuff on here, though. It's a triple LP. Yeah. They've done a, a second volume now too. There's like a, a part two. So, okay. But one thing this label has done, which is very cool, is they've actually done uh, sort of standalone reissues of some of their albums. That, All right, that's good. That, which is very good. Obviously, the uh, the reaction to that comp was was good, yeah. and they carried on doing yeah. it. Where's yeah. where's that label from? It's English. It's British. Yeah, that's an English label as well. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. I what, think what, um, mm. Japanese jazz is is has been getting more popular over the last five or ten years, isn't it? And you know, the, the, there are certain certain albums right. which are, are real holy grails for. Oh. Jazz collectors, absolutely. I mean, Three Blind yeah. Mice is a is a, a very very highly respected Three Blind Mice, yeah. uh, Japanese jazz label. Up I don't up. think I'm not sure if I have anything on that label, but I've got um, a whole bunch. I've got a whole you've... bunch of well, about five or six reissues, but even they're kind of quite expensive, but very well done. When I mean, they're sort of known for their high fidelity, aren't they? Three Blind Mice, sort of amazing yeah. sounding uh, records. Yeah, but we could do a whole series of episodes on Japanese jazz. I mean, there's so much to uh, discover. So I think those compilations would be a good place to start if you want to. Yeah. So Ian, we've managed to get almost an hour out of this. We've got three minutes left. I think that's okay. about as much as we're going to get out of this. So maybe one more. 
One more, okay. One more before we I sign off. I think it's a good, one, a good one to finish on. Okay. Uh, okay, from 1969. Oh. Have we have we gone back in time? We have. Got in time. From 1969. Oh, who's that fellow? Andy Williams. <laughs> Andy Williams. Andy Williams. Doing, uh, the the music for um, monosodium glutamate. Uh, Japanese monosodium glutamate, which is uh, Ajinomoto. Yeah, Ajinomoto. So, on the on the boring side, there's a version of Hawaii, Hawaiian wedding song, which I don't think I've ever listened to. Right. But on this side, there's three songs with Andy Williams singing in Japanese what? about monosodium glutamate. <laughs> it's excellent, absolutely superb. I love it. That's amazing. I've uh, is that a in, seven? in the past. I've, is that it's a seven? A, yeah, it's a seven. Inch. Inch. Seven. Inch. Yeah. I've I've covered one of the songs on on this on this EP really in in the past. Oh, I'm gonna definitely I'm gonna definitely check that out, man. Amazing. You might you might you might get one more in if we're quick. Uh, or is that or is that like the best way to end? Andy, I Williams think that's the best way to end. Singing about the, the, the first I think we can't top section. Andy Williams singing about monosodium glutamate. You can't you can't top that. Yeah. Yeah. And if you if you're ever worried about your you know the, the way that you speak Japanese, you, you can listen to that and feel super <laughs> confident. That. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. I think we're probably going to have to do a part two, aren't we? Oh, I think so. I think we're going to. Have yes, to. let's let's do it. Yes. I've got I've got loads more stuff. Me too. I've got a whole bunch over there, over there. I hope we gave a bit of a. I hope we gave a, gave a good uh, account of you know what was going on. From the from the late fifties to uh, nineteen seventy. Right. I think so. Yeah. Thanks, Ian. That was a lot of fun. You're welcome. So we're going to sign Take off care. now. Until next time, stay healthy. Bye. And stay clean. <laughs>